Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Kelvin Gertson, Manitoba's Minister of Education and Government House Leader, uh, here with Dr. Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer, who will give, uh, I think, the update for today, and then uh, shortly after, we'll go into questions uh, that you might have. Okay, thanks, Minister. Good afternoon. Our uh, current five-day COVID-19 test positivity rate is 1.5%, with uh, 23 new cases of virus being identified as of 9.30 a.m. this morning, bringing the total number of cases to uh, 1,489. We had uh, two cases in Interlake Eastern Health Region, one case in uh, Northern Health Region, and uh, 20 cases in the Winnipeg Health Region. 283 active cases and 1,190 individuals have recovered uh, from COVID-19. There are nine people in hospital and three of which are in intensive care. And number of deaths uh, related to COVID-19 remains at 16. Uh, preliminary investigations indicate that the two Interlake Eastern cases are close contacts of a known case. Uh, the other cases are still under investigation. Our testing numbers uh, yesterday, 1,266, bringing our total to 158,706. Uh, as testing sites uh, respond to testing volumes, some sites were, uh, that were uh, previously open are now closed. Uh, please uh, see the up-to-date list of uh, open testing sites and hours of operation at uh, um, www.gov.mb.ca slash COVID-19 uh, updates testing. Uh, Public Health has advised that John Pritchard School um, has uh, six new confirmed cases of COVID-19 that were identified as of this morning. Uh, this brings a total number of cases uh, in that school to seven. Public Health has advised that school that the following uh, grades uh, and cohorts should transmission to, uh, transition to remote learning today. Uh, that is the grade four, five split grades six, seven, and eight, and Henderson Early Learning Center, which is a before and after school program located at the school. All other grades and cohorts uh, can remain at the school for in-class learning. Uh, the John Pritchard School community has been notified. Uh, additional cleaning and high touch, uh, of high touch areas uh, was uh, completed. And uh, public health investigation will continue to determine the uh, transmission uh, chains of this virus. Uh, any close contacts or connected to the cases have been identified and contacted and advised to self-isolate for 14 days. Um, others who are at the site um, do not need to self-isolate, uh, but should self-monitor for symptoms. John Pritchard has moved to restricted or orange on the pandemic response system, given a number of cases and contacts involved. Uh, we continue to remind Manitobans of the importance of the fundamentals, um, staying home when you're ill, even if mildly ill, washing hands frequently, physically distancing um, at all times, uh, wearing a mask uh, in indoor public places, especially if physical distancing is not um, practical. Um, as far as testing goes, uh, public health uh, advises only symptomatic individuals go for testing unless, of course, they've been advised by public health to be, uh, to be tested. And the same thing goes with, with employers. Uh, please do not send employees for asymptomatic testing, um, but do uh, have processes in place for your employees to be uh, staying home when ill. And so um, I can pass it back to the minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rusin. Uh, I know there'll be questions regarding uh, John Pritchard School, and I'm sure other questions uh, as well. Just before we start with those, I want to thank uh, the principal of the school and really all of the administrators within our public and independent school system for the work that they have been doing. We knew that there would be, and we've, we've said uh, for weeks now, that we knew that there would be cases in schools. Um, our schools are part of the community. There are 220,000 or so students within our schools, tens of thousands of uh, teachers and other support staff within the schools. So of course we knew that there would be cases within the school system um, and we wanted to ensure that there could be quick response when those cases arose. So yesterday after uh, cases were identified, 
Uh, there was quick uh, communication with the principal and other leaders within the uh, school uh, who were able to communicate quickly with the uh, parents and guardians uh, who had uh, children who were affected and then the larger school community uh, as well. That work went on well into the evening uh, yesterday, uh, as well as uh, cleaning of the school, which I think began uh, then uh, yesterday uh, as well, to prepare to be open uh, today. Uh, and really these administrators and others in the school system who are responding when they hear about cases uh, are taking on an, another level of responsibility that uh, is outside of clearly of their normal or expected uh, work as an educator. And we really appreciate that effort uh, that they're undertaking and, uh, and we want to thank them for that. So with that, uh, I'm sure that you'll have questions and we'll open it up to those questions. Um, what can you tell us about the John Pritchard School? Is there evidence of transmission within the school? One might jump to that conclusion given the fact that we have this cluster that suddenly erupted. Right, so within the uh, within a cohort, uh, we have seen uh, the, the multiple cases, so um, we're still doing the investigation, um, but uh, but we still are uh, you know considering this transmission within within the school, and that's why we had uh, uh, advised those uh, those cohorts to uh, self isolate. And um, unless I'm forgetting something, this is the first transmission within the school. That's right. This is the first that we've uh, been aware of, and uh, so we have a a single cohort that was uh, mostly involved. There is a a single individual that uh, outside of that cohort that we're unable to link to that cohort. So it sure could be unrelated, but that's why there's uh, more than one cohort involved in the in the self isolation. Are these all students are that have tested positive at the school, or are there any staff or teachers mixed in? Uh, we're not specifically identifying any of them um, at this time. Um, is this kind of sooner than you'd anticipated that we would be sending classes home? Obviously, this is week two of the school year. It's not yet winter. People aren't all cooped up inside. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we saw cases um, in, uh, you know, in all these age groups uh, before we were back in school. So, so we did inspect, uh, expect to see it when we did go back, but we just had the safeguards in place that if we did see it, we would be able to uh, minimize the transmission and minimize the impact on, on that specific school and the whole school system. Were they uh, people tested positive showing symptoms at school? No, none of these cases were symptomatic while at uh, school. And were they wearing masks and practicing physical distance? From the uh, reports, uh, masks were uh, were in use. Uh, I believe in the uh, in the um, uh, classroom they had the one meter physical distancing. Any of these cases involve support staff at John Pritchard? We're not uh, commenting specifically about uh, the nature of the cases. Um, did we know the total number, uh, Minister Friesen? Uh, forgive me, Gertson. It's uh, uh, it's been a day. Wow. Forgive me, um, do we know the total number of students now that are remote learning? Yeah, so I think that there's uh, about 250 or so who would be uh, remote learning. That might go up uh, a little bit. So that speaks to the fact that the different school divisions back in June were asked to prepare, of course, for a number of different scenarios, and one of them was remote learning. And so they uh, were able to start that process today. Teachers would be connecting with the students ensuring that there is uh, an at-home learning environment that's very different than what we had in March. Um, and that uh, preparation that took place in the summer is now being activated uh, today. Parents have to turn on the dime, of course, when this happens. And it's, it's better than having the kids continue to go uh, to the school where the transmission is possible. But um, what, what advice do you have for parents who got notified at 9 p.m. last night that, oh, tomorrow, it's, not going to school. I mean, it's very much the same advice, you know, that we've been talking about uh, in, in June, that this is going to be a different school year. And whether that's keeping your son or daughter at home because they're demonstrating symptoms where you might otherwise have sent them to school, uh, or this, uh, this kind of a scenario where it happens uh, quickly. Uh, we are living in a uh, pandemic. And so things are going to be different. Uh, I think as of this morning, there was about 450 at least cases uh, identified in schools across Canada. Uh, there's 11 in Manitoba. So clearly this is something that every province, every, um, every school division and, and uh, virtually every school is dealing with in some way or the other. What do you think of the, uh, 
of developments in Quebec, uh, a little bit in Ontario we're seeing too, but the provinces where schools started earlier. We already have uh, Premier Legault musing about potentially making all schools go to remote learning because of the flare-ups that they've had. Well, I think, I think it speaks to the challenge, and, and clearly we knew that there would be cases that would uh, come into schools because there are cases within the community. Uh, we believe that the plan that's been developed together with public health, uh, particularly having cohorts, uh, allows us to continue to have schools operating even when cases are identified. And that's clearly what we heard from Manitobans, that they wanted to have uh, in-class learning. We know that that's the best place for students to be able to learn. So um, the fact that there are cases uh, is not surprising. Uh, the ability for public health to respond to those cases and to provide notification and clear direction uh, to parents and to guardians is really what the system was designed to do. Ms. Um, sorry, Dr. Rusin, um, do you have any sense of the number of people who are self-isolating as a result of those cases at John Pritchard School? Obviously seven people positive there, but maybe household family members who might be considered close contacts. Any idea of the scale of that? No, I don't, I don't have a, a number on that. So a lot of these were reported, uh, you know, yesterday evening, and, and so we're, we're still investigating a lot of those things. Yeah. Dr. Ruth, oh, go ahead, Carol. Uh, Dr. Rusin, initially the, the, the press release talked about John Pritchard School, everyone's wearing masks, the risk is low. Do you think that that was under estimated or that you lowballed the level of risk involved here? Well, it's something that uh, once we uh, continue our investigation, we're going to look uh, look to that, uh, look at those transmission chains. Um, it's it's too early to say whether, uh, you know, the first diagnosed case was actually the index case or not. So there's, um, you know, a few things that we have to look at. But, uh, you know, like anything in this pandemic, uh, we're, um, we're going to review, we're going to learn if, if needed and, uh, and, uh, and apply what we learn. Based on your investigation, um, how do you believe the virus got into the school? Community transmission, known? Do you have any idea about the uh, transmission chain? Well, yeah, we're still looking uh, uh, looking at that. I'm going to try to connect it. We'll, we'll certainly do um, you know outbreak investigations on this to try to see what we can uh, what we can learn from it. So I don't have a definitive answer on that. Are these, I know you we can't you won't say how many are students and how many are staff, but. Are they from one family primarily, or they're related, or on the same sports team? Is there any connections you can tell us about? Well, um, not uh, not specifically at, at this point. So a lot of this is uh, still early in our investigation, um, but uh, but we we do know that there is a, a one cohort that was predominantly affected, and and, a, and then a single case that's outside of that that co cohort, which may or may not be connected to that cohort. When you say cohort, you are confirming that we are talking about at least some students here, of course. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think the the cases there are some some students, there's some uh, staff involved. But uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, specifically, um, uh, you know, identify any any of that. Is a cohort more than a classroom? Not a, not a single cohort is is not more than a classroom. Minister Gertson, we were hearing a lot from parents about um, no matter what the schools do, they're seeing people out on breaks at lunchtime, at uh, convenience stores, gathered closely and mingling. Is there anything that? the school or the province can do to prevent that from happening? I don't know if you can lock kids up at lunchtime and, you know, shackle them to, you know, away from each other. I don't know. What what can you do? So I, I can assure you that uh, shackling is not being considered. Uh, but clearly, um, you know, there are challenges, right? When you're dealing with, with young people, that's always been true, regardless of what the situation has been. We've all been young at one point and, uh, and understand that. Um, you know, I hear different things, and some of it is difficult because it's anecdotal, right? And so I have also hear many uh, very good reports about different uh, schools who are having good experiences. I uh, heard from a teacher this morning again who talked about how adaptable um, her students have been within her class and how, you know, willing they are and really desirous they are of following um, the rules. I hear from my own uh, my own son about the interactions that he's having in school and um, and how people are trying to follow uh, the the guidelines and the guidance, the fundamentals from uh, from public health. 
But I also know that it's not going to be perfect. But that's not just true within the school system. I think that that's true within society generally, where you have different levels of compliance and different levels of, uh, of acceptance of some of uh, the things that are being uh, talked about. But I, I don't know, um, and I wouldn't be able to identify specifically that there, that prevalence is greater within the school system than it is uh, more broadly. But we'll continue, of course, to emphasize and to work with uh, school divisions and schools um, to see where there are problems and where there are you know, systemic problems, uh, how, to, uh, how to address those. At what point does your government reassess the back-to-school plan if you are having to have students learn remotely on a very regular basis? What would kind of cause that to happen, where you say maybe we will think about a more permanent switch to remote learning? So, so when it comes to remote learning, remember that you know back in June, uh, plans were uh, started to be uh, put in place, uh, particularly for those divisions that didn't have a lot of plans by that point in terms of remote learning. So this is a demonstration that their remote learning plans are in place and they can move to remote learning. The province has been working then with divisions now that they have those plans in place to say what, what kind of overarching framework uh, can there be for remote learning generally uh, because that's never been off the table. And so that's, uh, you know, that's a possibility if the scenario changes uh, in Manitoba. But also we're doing that because you know, in the future, uh, we think we need to have a more robust stat learning um, a capability in Manitoba. So it's also looking beyond the pandemic, but certainly in the context of where we are now, that work is, uh, you know, is happening with the divisions because they have been able to institute their own individual plans, as is demonstrated today, with uh, with John Pritchard. But this is, a, you know, this is clearly a recognition that there were going to be cases uh, in schools. Of course, we all would hope there would be no cases, but that's not realistic in a pandemic. The 400 or more than 450 cases that exist in Canada right now uh, in schools or have come from schools is a demonstration that every province uh, is going to have these challenges uh, and it's about how do you respond to those challenges and so today's uh, uh, evidence that that response uh, happened quickly last night to notify parents and then to be able to continue to have learning for those students who now won't be in their uh, normal classroom. Gertson, what would you say if parents or teachers or others would say, look, the province had a lot of time to plan for this, and why couldn't more have been done, not with remote learning or the bigger classrooms or whatnot? Um, I'm sure you're hearing some of that privately from people as well. What, what do you say to that criticism? Well, I think we hear that across uh, Canada, that these challenges uh, exist uh, in every province. And there are provinces that have different plans and some variation of those plans, even provinces that have had more reliance on remote learning are having significant challenges with that because it's increasing in some cases their class sizes within the schools as they're redistributing uh, the, the workload and so that's causing more risk within the school uh, setting. So there isn't a perfect plan in a pandemic, there isn't a zero risk plan in a pandemic, but there are plans that can mitigate that risk, that can deal with situations when they happen. Uh, and so I would say that, yes, those more than 450 cases that we've seen across Canada are a demonstration that every province will have challenges, uh, but the response to those challenges is, is what we're really honed in on right now. Dr. Rizin, you touched on testing um, testing sites in your opening statement. We heard yesterday that there were a number of people who were symptomatic who were turned away from testing sites due to capacity limits. Um, looking at the numbers for testing yesterday, there weren't a whole ton of tests done. I think it was 1,200 or so. Um, what is your response to that, kind of that people are getting turned away and we're not actually doing that many tests yesterday? What's well, I mean, it depends on, the, one is on the location, right? So each location um, comprises just a small proportion of the total. So so it's that could be relevant to it. Um, there's, a, depending on what time of day it is, that those tests will be added to today's account uh, with it. But uh, in saying that, we, we know that uh, come uh, fall, come uh, respiratory virus season, we're going to need to be able to increase our capacity for testing, and each region's uh, working on that right now. But, but right now, we have, like this morning, there were 40 people lined up. Uh, 
at Pembina this morning, we've seen ratcheting up, having more, I mean, let's, let's be clear, we're talking about the sampling sites, not the lab testing. Lab testing capacity is fine right now, right? Correct. Okay, so the sampling sites, if they're, in the past, especially in April and, and in May, you, you were able to rapidly expand that as, as per needed. Are we going to be seeing more of those in Winnipeg soon? We are working on, on an, uh, you know, an overall testing strategy, right? So that, that involves uh, sample collection sites, the lab, the reporting. And so we really are, are working on every uh, aspect of that to ensure we can ramp up the volume of testing and work on our turnaround time. We're certainly seeing more people go for testing as school begins. Are you prepared to ramp up collection site capacity right now? That's what's what's being worked on right now at the at the regional level. I think that there's a you know a lot of focus on being able to meet that increasing demand, uh, and we see that that demand fluctuates over time. Uh, so it is, so it does sometimes uh, pose a challenge, but we'll um, uh, you know we know we need to be able to meet that demand. In April, when that was happening, yourself and uh, Ms. Saragusta would say, okay, it's going to be tomorrow, it's going to be Tuesday. Are we going to see more by the end of the week in Winnipeg? I can't commit to that. Remember in April, a lot of things were um, were shut down. A lot of the healthcare system was uh, uh, had um, uh, people uh, uh, not doing their normal work, so uh, ramping up uh, uh, sites. Uh, shifting people from other areas of work was very easy at that time. It's not so simple at this time. So forgive me for this, but what's the point of having 2,800 test processing capacity a day between CADM and Dynacare if we can't actually collect those samples a day? Yeah, and we, I mean, you could see that we've reached uh, sample sizes much greater than this even in the recent past. So we, we have that capacity, but we're working on, on more. Okay, Doctor, we'll go to the phone for reporters from the Winnipeg Sun. Scott. Hi, uh, Scott Buck here, Winnipeg Sun. Um, I, I guess question, first question for, for the Education Minister. Um, it, it looks like um, last night two emails were sent out to parents, one that suggested four new cases, one that suggested five new cases, in some instances, parents are, are saying that they got one email for one of their children and another email for an, uh, their other child. Um, what, what, what was going on there? Why was there a, a perceived uh, miscommunication with these emails that were sent out? Uh, thanks, Scott. I believe that they were actually updating the uh, letter in real time. So as they got a uh, new positive test result, they were providing the most uh, accurate information as quickly as they could. Okay, thank you. Um, and my second question and follow-up question for Dr. Rusin. Uh, you've been steadfast in the message of practicing fundamentals, keeping physical distancing, and that. It, it, it's, it's obvious that you can't keep the two meters in school. I mean, you said that there was one meter separation, and yes, kids were wearing masks and all that. Um, but is it is it possible to, to... Is there more risk associated with the one meter separation than, say, the two and... If that's the case, why have kids in class at all? Well, I think it's a it's a gradient. Um, uh, I think that the the one meter separation seated uh, facing forward um, is uh, uh, does provide a, a you know that uh, a level of, of protection. Uh, I think that uh, you know the the further distance you are from someone, the the less risk is uh, is involved. So it's all a, all a gradient. Uh, but like we said with uh, with our response to our, our plans there in, in education is it's a multi-layered approach. It's ensuring symptomatic people aren't getting at, uh, at school, um, hand hygiene, disinfection, some form of distancing, and cohorting. So it's a, so a multi-layered approach. From CBC Radio Canada, Gavin. Hi there, Dr. Ruth. I was wondering if you could just provide us some more information about the case in, in northern Manitoba today. It says um, that they're on the, on the provincial website here, I'm looking at the map, and it says there's two active cases in the area of Shamatawa, York Factory, the Tasquayak, and Split Lake. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, and so the uh, the one case that's reported today in that in that region, the, the preliminary information I have is it's a it's a uh, a person who's actually living in the Winnipeg region, 
um, and so it's not actually going to be an active case in there, and we'll be updating that, but that's that's preliminary information right now. Um, Minister, for you, uh, I'm just wondering, we're, we're hearing about difficulties concerning remote learning, about having trouble hiring staff, um, certain divisions are still having trouble getting it underway. I'm just wondering whether it was, it, it, you think it was wise to start the school year uh, with learning in class before this, um, this remote learning system was really completely set up. So I think I'd, I'd need to hear more specifics about uh, the challenges that you're hearing. I know that uh, department officials are in contact with the different school divisions every day and uh, those challenges that they might have uh, are identified and are, are worked through. Uh, so I don't uh, have the specifics that you might be referring to. Um, I do think that um, there has been excellent work happening through the summer to ensure that there are remote learning opportunities available when students need to self-isolate, as now is the case as we're seeing with John Pritchard, or where they're immune uh, compromised and where there are challenges, like there often are in the school year. Um, let's remember now that uh, with 220,000 students, um, the beginning of a school year never goes entirely smoothly. There are often challenges that have to be worked through, more this year than most, obviously. Um, but uh, those are being worked through with department officials. From CTV, Jeff. Oh, hi, Dr. Roos, and this question is for you, Jeff, from CTV. Um, I'd like, if you could just clarify the answer you gave to Steve. Um, my apologies, I'm ha I have trouble hearing the, all the questions on the phone. Uh, I, I, is it the belief that these cases are transmission within the school? I, I just want to be clear on that. Well, I think we, when we saw the, this number of cases, uh, many of them within the same cohort, um, uh, we certainly don't have the, the complete investigation right now, uh, but we had to um, uh, act as if there was transmission within, uh, within that cohort, and that's why we've had them all self-isolate. So uh, our investigation is still pending, but I think when you see that many cases within a cohort, that would be our, uh, you know, our default uh, that we would start with. Thank you for that. Um, and my other question is, um, now that the school is in orange, um, for people, for parents, students, anybody going to that school, what can you remind us what restrictions are now in place? Mm -hmm. Right, and so for this, uh, this particular school, because it was a, a K-8 to school, um, the uh, the real restrictions are now that the, uh, the the remaining cohorts are still attending school as before. Uh, there is now that two meter physical distancing requirement uh, in in for the rest. Uh, if we had a school that say had nine to twelve, uh, once a school went to orange, then then nine to twelve would be uh, being done uh, remotely. Uh, but that doesn't affect this school. From City News. Mike. Hi, this is Mike Albany, City News. This question is for either Dr. Rusin or Minister Gertzen. Um, I know we say we're not surprised that there are cases already, um, but are you surprised that there's already seven cases in seven school days? Uh, should we be prepared for about this ratio of cases per day, or is this higher or lower than you anticipated? So uh, thanks for the question, Mike. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, we sort of charted out uh, expectations in terms of you know when cases might come. I suspect, uh, like we've seen with the uh, pandemic generally, there'll be ebbs and flows uh, for a variety of different reasons uh, at a variety of different times. Uh, what we did was to prepare for cases and ensure that we could respond quickly and appropriately uh, when those cases inevitably came up. Uh, when you look across Canada, there's more than 450 cases. I think there's 11 uh, in Manitoba, so clearly what we're facing in Manitoba is not uh, not unusual to what's happening uh, in Canada. We just need to make sure that our response uh, is appropriate to give parents that assurance that they're going to get the information they need, and I think yesterday was a demonstration of that. No follow-up. From the Brandon Sun, Emily. Um, hi there. 
Uh, my question is for Dr. Rusin, and I'm just wondering, uh, so um, do, pe do people from the same household as uh, the students in the co that affected cohort at John Pritchard School, do those household members also have to isolate for two weeks because they're close contacts with the people that were in that Right, yeah, and so typically a, a contact of a contact is not considered a contact. So, um, uh, so if there is a case, certainly one of these cases at home, it's going to be very likely that all of their household contacts will be, uh, will be contacts and they'll be required to self-isolate for 14 days. Someone who is a contact to a case, um, you know, the people around them aren't considered contacts. So, but, uh, you know, when you're self-isolating, uh, you shouldn't be really in, in contact with, with others. So it should be, uh, have plans in place to, uh, uh, to really limit any uh, close, prolonged contact with other people in that house. Uh, certainly if that person develops symptoms, then that household would become a, a contact. Okay. Um, yeah, so just, just to clarify, the, the only people that are required to self-isolate are the confirmed cases from that cohort and the, the other students within that cohort, staff and students within that cohort. That's correct, yeah, and, and you know, and it's, um, uh, when we're talking about um, uh, being contacts or a case of, of COVID, uh, the only people really required to self-isolate are those who public health has specifically advised to self-isolate as well. So, um, uh, so that's another uh, layer on top of that. Thank you. From CHVN, Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. This is Taylor. Um, at what point does the province decide to send um, students or cohorts home, cohorts home for remote learning? So thank you, Taylor, for the question, of course, when uh, there's notification that uh, students have to um, go home because they have been advised by public health to self-isolate, that automatically then results in remote learning uh, being activated by the school divisions. They've been doing that planning since June to make it a, a better experience and obviously what they would have expected uh, in March when there wasn't that time to prepare. So that is happening now with uh, the John Pritchard students who are impacted uh, and others who uh, within that school who are, uh, would be choosing to uh, have um, remote learning. Uh, so it's triggered by uh, public health uh, and their notification. Now, a lot of parents are looking at what's going on right now from the outside, wondering about their own children and how they can talk about this um, how can parents talk to their kids about the pandemic and staying safe in schools but not creating fear at the same time? Yeah, you know, that's an excellent uh, question. And I think all of us as parents, uh, you know, have struggled with that a little bit in terms of where is, uh, informa where is too much information too much. And it somewhat depends on the age of the child, right? So it's, uh, it's somewhat dependent on the age of your individual child. But certainly I think that uh, parents should be expressing to uh, to their students that they should be following the uh, guidance that they are getting within the schools. It goes back to an earlier question that there those provisions, while they might not always uh, uh, make sense to uh, to a student depending on what age they are from a medical perspective, but they're there to protect them and they should follow that guidance that there are a lot of good people at public health, uh, Dr. Rusin, chief among them, uh, who really have their best interests in mind and who are you know, thinking through a lot of different protocols because they want to help and protect them and to, uh, and to follow uh, that advice that they're getting uh, at their school level from their teachers or their principals. Thank you, Minister. We now return to the News Conference Theatre. Practical question. If, if uh, and maybe I misunderstood, but if there's one cohort involved in, in, uh, at John Pritchard, and the cohort is a classroom, and then there's another individual outside that cohort, that sounds like two areas. Why, why are there three grades and then a split class? 
Right, and so the, we have the the uh, the one cohort. We have a, a, a single person outside of that cohort that we can't necessarily link to to the specific cohort, uh, and then the other um, uh, the other cohorts are um, somewhat uh, um, uh, connected to uh, to that single case that single case that's outside of there. So it's more of a, an abundance of caution that we we expanded the cohorts that need to self isolate. So there's some intermingling. Okay. So, for any further cases that may, um, for, for any more people who may be tested positive who've been sent home um, among those grades, will public health identify the fact that they were those those kids yes. that were sent home? Yeah, we'll, we'll be linking them to to this uh, as a uh, as a, an outbreak investigation. So we'll be keeping people uh, up to date on the numbers. Doctor Rusin, how many of the seven patients at uh, John Pritchard are now symptomatic? So the, the information that I have is that um, uh, all of them were asymptomatic while at school, um, uh, but all of them developed symptoms and then went for testing. I see. So they were not all without symptoms when they got tested. So they had symptoms. What breakdown, forgive me, of the seven were symptomatic when they got tested? When I, um, uh, the information that I received were just uh, rolling uh, all these numbers up was that all of them were. All of them were symptomatic. Yeah, all of them. None of them were symptomatic at school, but all of them went for testing while they're symptomatic and, and appropriately isolated while they're symptomatic. Okay. I didn't, and the original, and the original, the first person who got tested, I thought was, forgive my memory here, asymptomatic. Was, was asymptomatic, um, but, but had uh, went for testing after developing symptoms. After, de well, asymptomatic at school. So everybody at John Pritchard, just so I'm being, making this idiot proof here, had symptoms, then got tested. That's right. And that's, again, this is a number of these cases were just reported to public health and then, uh, and then reported to me. So that's, that's information I have. They were all asymptomatic at school. That's correct. Ah, okay. Um, Minister, how many schools other than your sons have you visited since the start? Um, I will have visited, uh, incidentally, I think three schools, not as an official visit, um, but there are visits that happen incidentally now. You know, they're not, we're not uh, asked to uh, be visiting schools. We're supposed to be limiting the number of people who are coming from outside of the school. So now that it's a code orange at John Pritchard, does that mean that the, they're going to be moving students from classes that had didn't have two meters into spaces where the students are now remote learning? Like, are they, is there more room now for people to spread out, or how are they following the two meter requirement? Right, so that's, that's what the opportunity is there, is that uh, now that there's a, a, some proportion of students that are uh, self-isolating, um, they'll be able to uh, meet those, uh, the two meter requirements because of that added space. Dr. Rusin, how come we're not updating the uh, pandemic response system online in real time? Well, like for the school, uh, the one issue is that we've uh, we've decided that the uh, the school community and the people who are involved in the cohorts should hear it from us directly first before uh, before media or before a website. Uh, just one follow up to my question here, and I'm. Uh, forgive me if this sounds picky, but I understand we are trying to limit the number of people. But in order as minister to see how well the cohorting is working, how well it's working, um, do you intend to visit schools more to, to see it? Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful to visit schools. Now, remember that it's been um, so I have uh, visited uh, three schools, but not in an official capacity. Um, it's been about a week, and I think it was appropriate to um, make sure that people had the opportunity to acquaint themselves with their classes and the protocols, um, but I do think it would be appropriate uh, where it's considered safe to do so, of course. I'm just wondering if it, if the minister shows up unannounced, does that cause administration to, I mean, we've all seen episodes of The Simpsons, right, when the, print, when the superintendent shows up, <laughs> right? But I'm just wondering, is, is there an element of, you don't want to, if you tell them ahead of time there's a Potemkin village, they show up and they do things they might not do. If you don't show up, you can scare that the Jesus out of out of people. So I'd like to know who you in, think I am in the Simpsons, right? Like if, if you're if you're Bart, then who are you asking me to be? Uh, listen, I mean, I might end up visiting uh, uh, the schools unannounced or otherwise, but I do think it would be it would be helpful and appropriate. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks. What's that? Oh, yes. Okay.